Next, we'll talk about gene site enrichment analysis. This was motivated by a published study where two labs did a microarray experiment on the exact same condition. And when they look at the genes that are differentially expressed, each only had a very small number of genes that are different. But then if you look at the overlap, they have zero overlap. Nothing is, is significant. So you, question, you wonder, did they do the experiment right? Or maybe one is total garbage, the other is, is correct or something, or, or maybe both are garbage. Uh, but then when they look at, uh, say, genes related to a particular pathway, say, related to this experimental condition, they notice that, uh, so supposedly this is the one study, uh, sorry, no, this is one sample one condition, this is the other condition. And they look at a, a pathway or some annotation that has genes related to this experimental condition. You can see there, these are the genes. Um, based on the expression index, you can see that the data is not very, it's not a noisy experiment, it's pretty good. And if you were to call differential expression, you might call these two genes in here. In fact, that's probably real noise. Um, but then if you look at all the genes that are annotated by a particular gene ontology, you probably notice that not all of them are expressed higher in this X condition compared to the Y condition, right? Each gene by itself is not significantly different between the two. However, as a whole pathway or a whole molecular or biological process, it could be very, very significant because you're kind of looking at many, many dots together. They're all mostly below the line. And so that's why people decided maybe in, instead of calculating just the genes that are meeting a particular FDR cutoff for differential expression, we can examine all the genes based on their overall rank of differential expression and then check whether they are enriched for some gene ontology pathways or biological processes. And so that's gene site enrichment. The original study was published in 2003. It was like uh, one of these other algorithms that are cited by thousands of people. Um, they use a test called the Komonov-Smirnov test. This is a non-parametric test. And it calculates a cumulative fraction function which, which asks what fraction of genes are having this fold change or below this fold change. And so you can imagine if you look at all the genes between two conditions, uh, the fold change can start from, basically fold change of one is no differential expression. Fold change 10 is, uh, first condition is 10 times more, but uh, fold change of point Y is the second condition is 10 times more, right? So initially you can imagine if you have a very, very low fold change, no gene has a fold change below that. But as you go, imagine we look at all the genes on this microarray, you will get, uh, sorry, I forgot how originally, which I just, uh, I think, yeah. In fact, I think you, you would expect to see something like this for your original data, which is um, uh, very few, oh yeah, sorry. I think this one is your genome-wide expected. Uh, so basically, initially you have very, very few genes that are differentially expressed, and then gradually you have like tenfold change, threefold change, and then there will be a lot of genes like this that are not differentially expressed, right? They are close to one, and then towards the end you have some samples that are kind of differentially expressed a little bit, um, that have like a, a full change of five or 10 in the opposite direction. Um, yeah, so this just asks what percentage of all the genes have a full change below 10 fold, you know, below five fold, below one fold, below 20 fold. But imagine if you look at a set of genes that are annotated by a spe specific goal term, say uh, photosynthesis or some, some, some terms, and you just look at those genes, which will be the genes in this dot, uh, you would see that, for example, in this case, sorry, I forgot which one was the background, which one was the differentially expressed genes, but you can imagine 
there would be a lot of genes that have a full change close to zero, but then in your data, in this case, there will be a lot of genes that are downregulated. Supposedly, this is your original condition, control condition, and then after treatment, a lot of the genes annotated as having that goal term are slightly downregulated. So by itself, each gene is not significant, but as a pathway, you actually can get a very significant pathway. And so the kermanov smirnov test just measured the distribution of the GE you are interested in with the genome-wide distribution and see whether there is a big separation. You can think of this as a, yeah, so the user input is, you input all the genes in a differential expression, like after your Lima run, you got all the genes, you rank them by differential expression, it can be um, full change, right? Um, but we do not need to use a cutoff, right? Normally when you have Lima, you have cutoff by some full change and the FDR, but in this case, don't worry, just include everything. And you want to see whether the set of genes with a specific gene ontology annotation is involved in the coordinate upregulation or downregulation on this whole set, right? So you only find this significant as a whole, but make sure that you have to define the gene set ahead of time before you look at the data. You can't just say, oh, let's look at the differential genes and I'm gonna take the top 100 upregulated genes as my gene set to look at this. Then everything is significant. That's kind of cheating, right? You, you have to define the set from some other way, gene annotation or whatever. And then you test whether the group of genes annotated in that set have a differential expression different from your genome-wide, and that will give you the GS gene set enrichment. Do we have to worry about FDR or multiple hypothesis testing? Yes, because? Yeah, because you don't know which set you want to do. Every gene ontology is a set, right? So this, uh, you, you, do, you, you have this ahead of time. And so uh, later on, um, in addition to having the gene ontology set, people also created gene set from microarray experiment. Um, this is not the microarray experiment you are looking at. It's a microarray experiment that people have done historically. And so the, you can create a differential gene set from there. And so when you have a, a differential expression experiment, you check this, and what he will give you is Basically, you can imagine if you look at all the genes that are uh, differentially expressed, and if this pathway is not so interesting or that gene ontology is not interesting, every time you have a black line here, it indicates um, this gene is annotated as having that pathway or that it is in that gene set. And so if this gene set is not so interesting, it should be evenly distributed in this whole list based on your, your differential expression list. However, if um, this experiment is related to yours, you can imagine uh, that this list that you know, with the black bars are skewed to, to the left or skewed to the right of your experiment. And so if you have a, this one is skewed to the left, it will be up, but this one is skewed to the right, you can see that then it's all negative. And so the leading edge could be skewed to the left or skewed to the right. And the maximum difference here is, is this common of Smirnoff, the, the maximum difference of, of the genome-wide background and your enrichment level. How much is this genes annotated as this particular set being enriched in your data? Okay, so at the end, uh, you just give GSEA the, the whole the gene list ranked by their differential expression level, and it will tell you whether they are enriching some pathways and as we mentioned, later on, uh, GSEA also collected the gene set from microarray experiment. For example, um, you are treating some cancer cell with some drug, and it will look at the differential genes, and based on that, you run the gene set enrichment. And then uh, it might say, aha, if we look at this, your genes seem to have a significant overlap or skew to the left for somebody else's microarray that they um, say lung cancer or immune activation, right? They took those genes that are upregulated, even though this is not a gene ontology annotation, it's another gene set based on a different experiment. They took those differential genes to also create a gene set. 
And so every time you do your microarray experiment, you look at the different, I'm, I'm trying to perturb this gene and I see what it, what it does. It, it might tell you, oh, all the genes related to this is based on previous microarray related to uh, prostate cancer or drug resistance or something. And you will get some sense what your genes is doing. Okay, but make sure that the gene set are defined not from the data you are looking at per se, is defined either from gene ontology or from previous other people's expression. Okay, it will just give you some very useful insight. Question. Uh, so the base uh, gene set is your expression from the entire array. From the entire array, and, uh, right. Yes, those are the ones with the black line. And, and so where the expression values It's from your current microarray. Yeah, so you, you basically, every time you, you look at their, what, basically you look at their ranks on this whole thing compared to all the genes on these ranks, right? So, so the genes based on their expression and are annotated having to be in the list compared to all of the genes on your microarray. And if they are skewed to the left or skewed to the right, you say, oh, it seems like genes that are enriched in some pathways are, are more upregulated or more downregulated. So this way, you don't have to do a cutoff at FDR 0.5 just to say, adjust those. You can see, you know, maybe in some sense, you can imagine, yeah, if you just do the FDR and full change cutoff, you might only have 200 genes on the top. But if you look at a whole pathway, you will see this enrichment skew to the left by 3,000. Right? Then you can see the signal. Yeah, so this is being used a lot. Initially, it was used to annotate samples when you don't have enough differential gene expression. But nowadays, because people are also generating this gene list from other old expression data or published expression data, you can ask, what is my experiment similar to? And you say, ah, somebody else did a perturbation or some tumor profiling or some other things that those genes are kind of a significant overlap with my overall upregulated genes. That's actually very helpful to help you understand what is your gene doing or what is your drug doing? What is your perturbation condition really doing to the cells? Okay, yeah, so that's gene set enrichment. And yeah, so in summary, we talk about a lot today. Um, yeah, we try to do clustering it doesn't matter whether you have, yeah, most of the time you want to look, look at it, something that's different, right? Differentially expressed genes in multiple conditions. And you cluster them by, a, say, correlation distance. And for hierarchical clustering is you're greedy. You merge them gradually until you reach the end. And there are different linkages. For k-means, it's disjoint. And you have to decide a k that can maximize your uh, between cluster distance and minimize your within cluster distance. And there are some tricks to deal with outliers and noise. And then uh, every time you do a, a expression data, try a clustering to see whether you have batch effect. And if you do, you know, you can use either combat or SCBA to remove the batch effect. And, and then based on the clusters of genes with similar behavior, you can run gene ontology to see whether they are enriched in some pathways or processes or some, have some biological functions. And finally, we use gene set enrichment, just input all the genes that are ranked without filtering for differential expression to see whether it's similar to some previous experiment. But make sure for gene ontology and gene set enrichment to do multiple hypothesis testing. So you can see here, this is the p-value and this is the Q value, which is the false discovery rate. So you can see that the FDR may not be as, so FDR is usually higher, a larger number than your P value. Okay, that's all for today. Thanks.